want to believe, but everybody say, I want to believe. I want to believe. I hope so. I hope so. Here's how I want to start this series. I simply want to say this. If you are new or if you haven't been coming in for very long, you've been here for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and you haven't heard me say this, I, I want to start this way. Now, simply to say, the church at Lake Forest is a safe place for you to uh, experience faith, for you to question faith, for you to come and not believe exactly what we believe, but still belong here. You can belong here without believing what we believe. This is a place where you can come and, and challenge a little bit, right? I mean, if, if you want to sit down over coffee and you have questions about a, about a message, about something you heard somebody say in a small group, you heard me say on stage, maybe it's just something that you've had questions about your entire life because when you were a kid, you, you know, your grandmama took you to church and, and you heard something and it just doesn't quite ring true and you're trying to figure out what is that all about, Welcome to the place where you can ask those questions, all right? And welcome to the series that I hope, it may not answer all of those questions. It, it probably won't. You know, in four weeks, I cannot answer all the world's questions about God, right? But in just a couple of weeks, I want to hit some highlights. I want to hit some things that, that I really think some people are, are questioning, they're asking about. They want to believe, but there's something going on in their lives that there was something that, that went on maybe even years ago that for whatever reason... Is keeping them from just sort of walking across that line. And maybe that, maybe that defines you. Maybe you've even been coming to church for years. But there's something in the back of your mind that's just, that's just nagging you. There, there's something going on that, that you know, you've experienced that you're just wondering where God is. Wondering who God is. And you really want to believe and, you, and you've been sitting in pews for years. But you're just not quite ready to say, you know what, God, I'm going to give you my whole heart. I'm going to give you my whole life because I don't really understand. So hopefully over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. Because you know, as, as I've been thinking about this series and, and you know, kind of making some notes from week to week and reading through other guys' notes who have preached on the same kinds of topics and listened to messages and, and try to dig into what God's Word says and what I believe it says for our church and our context and our community, um, I've been thinking about really how our community, how our, especially in the Bible Belt, right? I mean, we're the Church of Lake Forest. We're in North Mississippi, Memphis, right? I mean, we, we are the Bible Belt. And there are, not only are we in the Bible Belt, you know, we're, we're close to Memphis. They just celebrated, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, the, the 50th anniversary of, of his of his assassination. I mean, you know, all of that stuff has been going on in and around our city. There's race relations. There's God relations. It's just, just kind of, it's who we are as a culture, but our culture has changed. And our religious landscape, our faith landscape, has changed just from when I was a kid. I know some of you are, are older than me. Some of you are twice as old as I am. And you can remember, like, how it was when you were a child and what dramatic change even the Bible Belt South has, has gone through when it comes to faith in God. Because when I was a kid, it seemed like everybody went to church, right? And if everybody didn't go to church, at least it seemed like... Everybody believed in God and everybody not only did I mean, you know, I know there were atheists and there were people who were just adamantly opposed. But generally speaking, our culture would say, yeah, I believe in God. As a matter of fact, I go to this church, even if they only went once or twice a year. Right. Or, or if they went when they got married and they're planning to go again at their funeral, they would still say, I've got a church. Right. They would say, yeah, my, my mama goes to this church and that's where I belong. They would say something like that. But in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that. That culture, even in the South, has dramatically changed. More and more people have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Not just not, just not Christian, but not religious, not faith-filled at all, regardless of faith. As a matter of fact, the number one, for about the last decade or so, the number one fastest growing religious segment of the United States population and currently the second largest religious population of the United States is actually no religious affiliation whatsoever. The fastest growing religious segment of our population, as well as Europe, as well as Canada, like all of North America, all of Europe, the fastest growing religion is actually no religion at all. Sociologists call them the nuns. They have, they, they have no religion. And, and that encompasses atheists, agnostics, 
And those who just, they're just not sure what they believe, so they just believe nothing. And they would simply say something like, some of them would say, I want to believe, but maybe some of them. But a lot of them, a lot of, and I'm saying them, this is us, right? This is our community. It's us even in this room. Some of us would say even, not I want to believe, but, but I used to believe, but. I used to believe in God. When I was a kid, I remember growing up, you know, as a teenager, I had, I had a great friend uh, he, in high school and went to church here. I had a couple of great friends. You know, he went to church here. Uh, we graduated around the same time. What, this one in particular, he's still in our community. He's no longer part of our church. I'm not sure that he goes anywhere, but I think he is right now. Um, but I remember as a kid, as a teenager, uh, we were probably, you know, 16, 17, maybe 18 years old. I know it was before uh, we graduated high school. And uh, his parents had been a part of our church off and on, and his siblings off and on. And I just remember one time, you know, his dad said to him, when are you going to grow up? Because church is, for, church is for kids and for old people. And when are you going to grow up and stop going to church? And he, listen, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. If you're a teenager and your own father says that to you because he used to believe but, and he's wondering when, you're going to get to that but, right? So, so that he would say, I used to believe, but. Listen, that's the reality. That's the reality of a lot of people who are a part of our church, who are a part of our lives, our community. If we want to say that we're going to be for our neighbors in the next generation, these are some of the questions that we need to be prepared to answer. So whether you're here this morning, and, and that defines you, right? I want to believe, but. I'm not, I, haven't, like, I just haven't crossed the line. You know, if that defines you, obviously, you know, I mean, I'm not going to hide anything. My, uh, my hope during this series is that you'll trust Jesus as your Savior. You'll come to the point where you sort of cross that line in your faith and say, I wanted to believe, and now some of my questions have been answered, and so now I do believe. I mean, that's, that's my hope and my desire for you. And for those of you who, you know, you're, you're part of our church, you, you're strong in your faith, you know who you are, you know who God is, you can easily identify who God is. My goal for, for you is that during this series, you get some questions answered and maybe some language that you can share with your coworkers, that you can share with your family members, that you can share with your friends, that you can share with our community so that when they make statements like, I want to believe, but this happened, where is God? Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Whatever's going on in their lives, I hope to give you a little bit of language, maybe some places you can go in the Bible to answer some of those questions so that you can be the person who takes them by the hand and leads them back to God or maybe leads them to God for the very first time to help them get their faith sort of across that line from unbelief to belief. So that's why we're doing this series. I want to believe, but because all of those people who say I used to believe but I no longer do, or I want to believe, but especially those who have, who have walked away from the church, like my friend, like his dad, who have walked away and have never come back, here's what I believe about them. And this is what I think we're really gonna, this is the, this is the core of the series. Here's what I believe about them and about you, if, if that defines you. That you're not walking away from God. You're not walking away from the God of the Bible. You're not walking away from a God who loves you, from Jesus who loves you, and, and, you're, and maybe if you're saying, I, I want to believe, but that God that you might be wanting to believe in may not even be the, the God that's in your mind is not the God of the Bible. The God I think that people are walking away from, that those nuns, that fastest growing religious population, the nuns, the God that they're walking away from is actually a distorted view of God. Because I believe if you've got an accurate view of God, if you've got an accurate view of who Jesus is and, and his relationship and what he did for us and what God did for us, and not just a Sunday school faith. Because again, we're in the Bible Belt, right? You could probably walk into any mall, any Target, any Walmart, and ask somebody in Horn Lake, South Haven, Olive Branch, Hernando, Walls, who is Jesus? They can probably give you the answer. You know, if you ask somebody last week on Easter Sunday, what's the meaning of Easter? They may have started with Easter bunnies and family and candy, but if you said, yeah, but what's the real meaning of Easter? Most of our community would respond with, well, it's Jesus because I heard that he died on the cross. And I really, they may not know really, you know, why we celebrate it, but they probably know. They have that knowledge, that basic Sunday school childhood knowledge of who Jesus is, of who God is. 
But I don't think they've got a full grasp. And sometimes I don't think we as a church have a full grasp. And so we struggle from week to week, from day to day, from season to season in our lives, just sort of letting go and letting God take control because we don't have a complete, full understanding of who God is. Now, the other thing that I'm not going to be able to do is define who God is in four weeks. Right? I'm not going to be able to answer every single question about who God is because God, there's, there's a part of God that's easily definable. But there's a part of God that makes him God and us not. There are just some things about God that we do take on faith, that we do take on faith. But there's a lot in God's word. There's a lot in the Bible to teach us about who God is. And so I, I hope that over the course of the next few weeks, we can clear up a few of those distortions. So let me give you an idea of where we're going. I'm not going to tell you what we're doing today just yet. Uh, but next week, we're going to talk about Goosebump God. We're going to talk about Goosebump God. And this is for those who would say, you know what, I, I want to believe God, but I don't really feel him. Like, how is it that, that I'm supposed to believe in a God that I, like, I'm supposed to pray to, but I don't hear him, and, and I can't see him, and I don't really feel him? Like, I, I come to church, and I see all these people, like, raising their hands, and they're singing songs, and I, I went to some, you know, camp when I was a teenager, and people talked about feeling the presence of God, and I never felt that. I didn't get the goosebumps that everybody else did. So next week, we're going to talk about goosebump God. In week three, we're going to talk about heartless God. Heartless God. Heartless God is the God who allows bad things to happen to good people. How in the world could God allow a shooting to happen? How could God allow uh, a, a natural disaster to happen to kill all those innocent people? If God really loves us, how could God allow that to happen? I want to believe in God, but... I just think he's a heartless God. We're going to talk about that in week three. And then in week four, we're going to talk about Killjoy God. This may be one of my favorites, all right? Um, because, like, we just want to have fun, right? How do, I don't want to, I don't want to worship, I don't want to believe in a God that's got all these rules, right? He's just a killjoy. He doesn't really want me to have any fun. In week four, we're going to discuss Killjoy God, all right? So this week, to kick it off, we're going to talk about a little different God and, and to kind of introduce that. You know, last week uh, for Easter, I taught you a new term. I taught some of you, if you were here, I taught you a new term that, that I think those sort of my age and older, a lot of us had never heard before, but those my age and younger kind of had heard, and the term last week was, was FOMO, fear of missing out. Y'all remember that term? I mean, I had a couple of people like on Facebook, and I think my mother-in-law said I, I'd never heard that word before, right? I mean, you know, people on Facebook were like messaging me and saying, hey, I'd never heard it before, but I've heard it six times this week. Right, they start, they start popping out, you know, to people, a uh, fear of missing out. So for all of you older generation, last week I taught you a younger generation term. This week we're going to flip the script a little bit, all right? So this week I need my older generation to participate. Can you participate? If you're my age and older, right? That's not that old. But if you're my age and older, can you all participate for me this morning? Say yes if you can. Okay, good. So everybody that said yes, great. You got it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a little game called Television Tunes. Television Tunes. All right, you're about to hear a tune from a TV show. It was on TV when I was a kid, when some of you were kids or teenagers or maybe young adults. All right, this, these are television tunes from the 70s and 80s. I know that's not real old, but from the 70s and 80s. All right, some of you are thinking, like, that's just not old at all. All right, for a lot of you, you're thinking the 70s. Wasn't that, like, when the Civil War happened? All right. Okay. 70s and 80s. So, as soon as you know the name of the tune, somebody's got to yell it out. This is the participation part. My wife cannot participate because she heard me put it all together last night. All right? As soon as you know the tune, yell it out. Here's number one. The love boat. Very good. The love boat. Y'all remember this? Whoa, it's not 
all in the family. Mama's family. I think, yeah. I think somebody under 30 said Mama's family. Mama's family. They've been watching real lives. All right, Mama's family. Let me get number six. Ah, Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angels. There you go. Uh, number seven. Number seven. This one defined a generation. Mash, mash, mash. All right, number eight. Thank you for being a The Golden Girls, yes. Everybody here for Golden Girls. Golden Girls. Golden Girls. Golden Girls. One of my favorite shows as a kid. I know it's weird, a bunch of old ladies on screen, but I love the Golden Girls. They were hilarious. All right, number nine. Number nine. Freeze Company, Freeze Company. All right, now don't play number 10 yet. Don't play number 10 yet. Here's why I don't play it because I believe that number ten is the most iconic music of my childhood and some of your young adulthood. Every Friday night, I probably already gave it away, but every Friday night it was probably the solid gold on Friday night or Saturday. Friday night, every Friday night, the solid gold in this show. Play number ten. Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. I'm surprised it's like not everybody. You hear that? You probably got it. Who killed Jr. Right? I mean, that was the question for like a year, a whole season. Are right, you turn it back off? You turn it back off. You might have to clear the audio. That's just gonna play. That could be just a soundtrack for, you know, for everything. Dallas. All right. So every Friday night it was Friday night, right? Friday night it was like solid gold in Dallas, and for a whole, for a whole like. Nine month period, everybody asked the question, who killed JR? If I'm not mistaken, wasn't there? He went, well, yeah, he wasn't dead, but we asked the question, who killed JR? Because JR, you know, he died, but it was actually a dream. It was weird. Bobby was asleep. And y'all know who I'm talking about? Some of y'all know. See, I, and a lot of you are like, I have no clue. I have no clue what he's talking. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there was even like a Super Bowl halftime fan that asked the question, like, who killed JR? I mean, it, it just sort of defined. Like that, that season, the early 80s was, was, was Dallas and some of those other shows. What do all those shows have in common? They're old. They're old. <laughs> yes, they're old. Let me tell you, because that's a great answer. Let me tell you what they all had in common. You had to show up at the exact time in front of the TV, TV on, Maybe remote in hand. You might not have had a remote. You may have had to like walk up and turn the knob and like click, 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 and then you had this little, this little like fine tune adjustment, and you kind of fine tuned it. You took the rabbit ears, you know. You had to get up out of the, you had to get up out of the recliner and like climb up on the roof and turn the giant antenna, you know, to get it just right. You wanted whatever your favorite show was. All of it had to be just right because if it came on at seven o'clock and you were not there. At seven o'clock, guess what happened? You missed it. You missed it. VCRs existed, but nobody had one because they still cost like ten thousand dollars, right? Nobody had a VCR. It might have been a Betamax somewhere, but nobody recorded with one of those. I mean, you just—if you weren't there, you missed it. And you know what else? There was no rewinding. There was no fast forwarding, and you had to watch all the commercials. All the commercials. And when the season ended, not only did you have to, like, you watched it on Friday night, and then Friday night, and then Friday night, and then Friday night, and then Friday night, and then, like, who killed JR when the season ended? Like, that was it. You couldn't rewatch watch it and figure out. You know, maybe there's some clues. Maybe I missed something. No, no, no. It was over. Some new show was on in that time slot, and you had to wait till the next August or September or October. A full, like, nine months, ten months sometimes. And then the new season started. You couldn't go back and rewatch old seasons. There was no such thing as streaming. There was no such thing as on demand. Some of you were like, how did you survive? <laughs> right? Now, now be honest. Be honest for a second. How many of you streamed a movie, TV show, or better yet, you binge watched more than one episode of your favorite show this week? Raise your hand. All right, there you go. Not everybody, but a good, a good majority of us 
did one of those things. And even if you didn't like stream from Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime or whatever, a lot of you were on Facebook and you were scrolling through, right? And you streamed some kind of video that was on demand. And like if you didn't have your phone in your pocket dinging you every time your best friend cooked some new meal or every time my dad finds something that's not good for me on, you know, on Facebook and shares it and it dings, you wouldn't know what's going on in the world, right? Because we live in this on-demand world. I mean, okay, when I was a kid, you padded two pockets. If you're a guy, you padded two pockets when you walked out the door. You made sure you had your keys and you felt for your wallet, whichever side you carry it on, right? Before I walk out the door, got my wallet, got my keys, I'm out the door. Now, what do you do? You pat your wallet, you pat your keys, but the first thing you check for is, do I have my phone with Right, you're, you're, and you don't even pat that pocket. You're like reaching in, making sure, and, and just just to make sure it's all okay. Good, I got a good charge. I have to plug it up in the car and see it back in the pocket or whatever. Right, the world has changed. We've become this on-demand world, and on-demand God is the God I want to talk about this week. On-demand God. See, on-demand God doesn't actually exist, but a lot of people believe that He does. A lot of people have this faith in what I would describe as on-demand God. On-demand God is not new, right? On-demand God didn't come around in the last, you know, 10 years as, as on-demand rose. On-demand God has been around for a very long time. But on-demand God is that God that, that we pray to and we expect an answer from, right? Like, God, I, I'm praying to you and I'm asking you to help me. I'm asking you... To, to intercede. I'm asking you to heal. I'm asking you to give me a new job. I'm asking you to save my marriage. God, I'm asking you to do this. And then sometimes on demand, God doesn't give you what you ask for. And we've come to a place in our culture and in our lives that a lot of us, as we, as we pray to this on demand, God, we begin to lose faith. Because that on-demand God is not answering our prayers like we expect him to answer our prayers. But the reason that on-demand God doesn't answer our prayers the way we expect him to answer our prayers and when we expect him to answer our prayers is because he doesn't exist. If you're praying to an on-demand God, you're praying to no God whatsoever. That God does not exist. Here's a couple of examples. You know, maybe as a teenager, maybe as a teenager, some of you in this room. Maybe even right now, but maybe a few years ago, you're praying for your mom and dad's marriage, right? I mean, that's an important prayer. As a teen, you, you see your mom and dad, they're arguing, they're fighting, and you're just, you know, you're on your hands and knees every, every Friday, Saturday night as they're arguing. And maybe they're even taking you to church on Sunday, but you're praying to God saying, God, save my parents' marriage. God, help my dad to stop yelling. Help my mom to stop throwing things. You know, whatever it is, help my dad to love my mom more. Help my mom to love my dad more. God, keep my parents together. And then your parents got a divorce. And for some of you and for some people in our community, that on-demand God that they were praying to, they expected God to intercede. They expected God to save their parents' marriage. And when that didn't happen, for whatever reason, and for that reason in particular, they walked away from God. They said, I wanted to believe in God. I prayed. And it didn't happen. And I don't want to marginalize that prayer. And I don't want to marginalize, I, I don't want to de-emphasize that God wants to save marriages. But when marriages fall apart and teenagers or husbands or wives or friends are praying for that and God doesn't answer that prayer, it's very easy to begin losing faith because we've been praying to an on-demand God. God, I'm giving. I'm giving. I'm like, God, I'm going to church like all the time. I've been tithing. I didn't tithe before, but I decided to give 10%. God, not only am I, am I giving 10%, I'm trying to give a little bit more. God, I've, I've changed my life. I've, I've started doing the right things. I'm trying to make the right decisions. I'm trying to, you know, financially, I'm, I'm trying to pay off my debt. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. And God, I've been praying to you that you will help me financially, but I'm still broke, God. Like, what's going on? I lost my job, God. Now I'm even in more debt. Because I can't afford my bills. God, I'm going to have to sell my car. I'm going to have to sell my house. I don't know how I'm going to pay for my food tomorrow. God, where, where are you on demand, God? Why are you not answering my prayers? That happens all the time. And people begin losing faith. I want to believe. And I was giving and I was doing what God expected. But it didn't go the way that I thought it would. The way that I thought it should. And I used to believe. 
but not anymore. Here's one that has struck a nerve with several friends of mine. And as a pastor, especially as a kid's pastor, I've heard many times, God, I want to have a baby. I'm serving you. I'm praying to you. I'm praising you. We're trying hard. We're pregnant. We lost it. God, where were you? I want to believe in you. But you didn't come through for me. You see, that God that we are losing faith in, when things like that happen, is an on-demand God. Because in our minds, what we're thinking is that God exists to serve us. But God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. Now, that's a pretty easy thing to say. But the reality is, as I describe those events that I just described to you, that's a difficult thing to swallow. It's a difficult thing to understand. Somewhere in there, faith has to come into the picture. And the only way that you can understand that, that God does not exist to serve me. He's not some genie in a bottle that I'm, you know, I'm rubbing the bottle. He's going to give me my wishes. The only way that you can understand that when you're in the middle of one of those situations where you're praying earnestly and you're wondering why isn't God listening. The only way to, to understand, to, to stomach, to, to fathom that we exist to serve God is to have the right understanding of who God is is to understand what our place is in the world and to understand what God's place is in the world, to have a proper understanding of the sovereignty of God. Because it's really easy, if you don't have that proper understanding, it's really easy to be praying to the on-demand God and something doesn't go right. It's really important, without a doubt, it's really important, but it doesn't go the way that you thought it should, that you've been praying for it to go, when that happens and you've been praying to an all demand God, the greatest temptation and the greatest sadness that I believe that God has is when you walk away from faith. And it's happened time after time after time. So what I want to do this morning is I just want to give you, I want to give you three things, three, three pieces of the identity of God. Again, this isn't going to completely describe the all-encompassing God and who God is. But I want to describe three things to you that I believe if you know these, if you begin to, to read and study God's word and, and you dig into these three areas and you, under, you come to an understanding of this and understand who God is, it will help you figure out when I'm praying those prayers and it doesn't happen, I'm going to recognize that I've been praying to an all-demand God and I need to pray to this God. I need to pray to the God of Scripture. So number one is this, God's heart is always loving. What I want you to know about God, most of all, is that his heart is is always, always loving. Now, if you're a, a parent in here, I know not everybody's a parent, but if you're a parent, and if you're not a parent, maybe you can imagine this. But if you're a parent, you would probably say, I love my kids. You would probably even say, I love my kids unconditionally, right? I mean, it, you, you, you never stop loving your kids. We call God our Heavenly Father, right? He always loves us, and we get our love for our children from our Heavenly Father. Now, I said, you always love your kids, but you don't always like your kids, right? They're probably, if we're honest, there are probably some days that you just like to knock your kids in the next week, right? But you don't. And why don't you? Because you love them. You love them. But there's a difference between love and power. There's a difference between love and power because, you know, what we say when we're praying to that on-demand God is, God, if you love me, then your power will show up and you'll give me what I'm asking you for. No matter how trivial or how important it is, God, if you love me, then your power is going to show up. Now, think about a parent for just a second. What do parents do? When their kids ask them for something out of love, if, if their children are asking for a gift and they can afford a gift, they give them the gift, right? I mean, you know, you love, you give. And, and we think that that's the way God works 24-7, but is that how a parent works 24-7? Not always. So let's say that, you know, for instance... Um, your child forgets their lunch. They, they, they go off to school one day, they forget their lunch, right? As a parent, most of the time, you're going to grab that lunch and you're going to take it to school and you're going to drop it off because they forgot the first time. And the second time, maybe. But if that becomes a habit, right? Do you love your kid any less if you don't drop their lunch off for them? 
No, what are you trying to do? You're trying to teach them responsibility. See, your kids at, at school and they're hungry. They want their lunch, but they forgot their lunch. And if mama loves me, I'm going to call mom. I'm going to text mom. I'm going to call dad. I'm going to text dad. If they love me, then they're going to bring me my lunch because they always feed me, right? I mean, that's a parent's job. Parents are supposed to take care of their kids. They're supposed to, 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 to provide for us. It's my mama's job to bring my lunch to me. <laughs> that's how we think about God. It is. It's God's job to bring my lunch to me. But as a parent, we know that there are times when we don't want to do something for our kids. We want to do something in our kids. And there are times that even though God loves us, he wants to do something in us. Now, there are lots of times that God wants to do something for us. But there are lots of times that God wants to do something in us. His heart is always, always, always loving. Romans uh, Romans 8.35 says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Let me pause right there just, just a second. I'm pretty sure that none of you are going to be naked at sword point this week. Right? If you are, share that story with me because that will be hilarious and I'll share it next week. i use it as a, maybe in a future week, right? If you're naked this week at sword point, like, but that, that's not us, right? But, you know, you read that verse, so let's, let's update it just a little bit. Back in verse 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Maybe financial trouble, unemployment, cancer, a broken relationship. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But Chris, but Chris, wait a second. You're telling me nothing separates me from the love of God, but I pray for it. And I know that God wants marriages to stay together. I know that, 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 that God can heal I know that, that God, I believe that God loves me, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think that if God loves me, he would give me this because this is a good thing. This is a, why would he not give me something that is a good thing? Here's the problem. We expect God to prove his love for us when he answers our prayers. But God does not prove his love for us in an answer to prayer, God proved his love for us when he sent his one and only son. The Bible says that we are all sinners, that we all need a savior. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we celebrated Easter last week. That the proof of God's love, the Bible says this, that while we were still sinners, before we were perfect, before we were saved, before we had any faith in God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God does not prove his love to you by answering your prayers. He doesn't. He proved his love for you by sending his son, Jesus. Easter is the proof of God's love, not your prayer life. Your prayer life, the way that you pray to God and the things that you ask God for has more to do with you than it does with God. It has more to do with your heart where your heart is and drawing closer and closer to God than it does with who God is. Because God's already proved his love for you. He still loves you even when those prayers don't, don't get answered the way that we expect them to answer. So number one is God's heart is always loving. God's heart is always loving. Number two, God's ways are always higher. God's ways are always higher. Listen, there are a lot of things that happen in life that I would not even attempt to explain. Like the loss of an infant. Someone, someone dying in their prime before their time. I can't explain, I cannot explain why that happens. You know, when I go to, to a funeral for anybody, it's difficult, whether they're young, old, in great health, in horrible health, when the person passed away, and I sit down with the family, it's difficult to have a conversation with that family about the loss of their loved one. Because that's an emotional time. And that's a time that God wants to be a part of. But it's very easy in those times to blame God. And I, it's above my pay grade. 
All right, it is above my pay grade to know what God's plan is. So in those moments, what I have to do is I do have to have faith that God's ways are higher than my ways. I, I take heart in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. A child is born with a deformity. A great person is, is struck down in the prime of their life. Natural disaster take the, takes the lives of innocent people. Why does God allow that to happen? God's ways are higher than our ways. I can't explain that away, but here's what I will say about, about some of these things. Is that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we get to understand God's plan. In the end, it's God's plan, not our plan. But sometimes we get to understand God's plan. Like, for instance, let's say you're, you're dating this guy, right? And you think he's the one, he's the one, he's the one, and then the relationship ends, right? I mean, like, maybe even you were engaged, but the relationship ends, you're crushed, and you're thinking, God, where were you? I mean, he was perfect, he went to church, he wanted to have kids, like, this was going to be it, he was great, you're crushed, it's over. And then a few months down the road, you meet a new guy, and you get married, and you live happily ever after. Sometimes in life... Those things that in the moment feel like the end of the world, God was using to prepare us for what's coming next, for the better plan that he wants for us. You know, maybe you were going to do something like buy a house. I know when we were in South Florida, uh, we looked for a year, literally, like every weekend. We were looking at houses, trying to find, and we put offers down. In one weekend, I put in four offers on four different houses. Now, that's, that's, that's taking a risk. All right, four offers on four different houses and none of them got accepted. And we would go into houses because we were looking for fixer uppers, right? We were going in because, man, real estate in South Florida is astronomically expensive. We were going in looking for fixer uppers. I mean, we were going in houses. They were like two, two hundred plus thousand dollars that had sheetrock on the walls. You know, they had mold growing. They needed new cabinets. They like the bathrooms were falling apart. I mean, like that's South Florida real estate. And we had this budget that was more than we had ever spent on a house. And we were looking for fixer uppers, all right? And we kept getting denied and denied. And like we were getting frustrated a year later. So finally, I mean, our real estate agent literally said one time, if you'll just add $100,000 to your budget, you can, get that, you can get what you're looking for. <laughs> she, are you kidding me? You know, and we put an offer in on a short sale. And it was like the perfect spot for us. It was a great location, a great house. It was a good price what they were asking for it. And we sat, like it, it sat as a short sale. If y'all know what that is, I'm not going to, you know, Google it, right? On demand. But uh, it was a short sale and, and it just kind of sat out there for weeks and for months. And then we finally heard that they just decided not to sell it. And it wasn't long after that, just a couple of weeks that we went in this house and we were just frustrated. We didn't care at that point anymore. We kept raising our budget, raising our budget. We never got that hundred thousand dollar bar. We kept adding to the budget because we finally had to get a house that, that just was not a fixer up, right? We finally made an offer on a house, full asking, like it even appraised for less than what we offered it for, and I paid the difference out of my pocket. That's how desperate I was. We finally got in a house, and we lived in it for, for like two or three months. And I'm in the backyard, and I'm just mowing one day. I'm not pushing the mower. I was riding one more, riding. Uh, it was a pretty good-sized backyard, and it just hit me. God, you blessed me. Like that year of struggle, we thought we were never going to get anything. God, you gave us the perfect house. I know that seems that seems very simple, kind of contrite. You know, that's that's not a loss of a loved one. But I mean, right? If you're an adult, you want a good place to live. You want to be able to provide for your family. You want some things, and you may even be praying to God, and you may get denied, 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 and you don't don't even realize that God's holding what's best for your family for you. And sometimes he shows you what that plan is. And I realized that, that God gave us a great house. And not only did God give us a great house, we were in exactly two years. And when we sold that house, we made enough profit off of that house to recoup all that we had lost in the last two houses. When the, when the housing bubble collapsed, we made enough, like, like a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars to pay ourselves back from all the money that we had lost. God was taking care of us and preparing for us. All those houses that we didn't get, God gave us the perfect one for us. 
And he does that time after time. But you know, sometimes you don't get the plan. Sometimes you don't get the plan. Sometimes, sometimes God doesn't lay out the plan for you in the moment, in the day. Sometimes it's, it's maybe even years and years and years. You know, you have a child and, and your child has some sort of deformity or some sort of birth defect. You know, and parents mourn that and they pray for that and they're wondering, you know, God, why me? And then when you meet parents who have been walking close to God years later, as their kids are older, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15, 20 years old, what they'll tell you is, why not me? Because God chose me to bless me with this beautiful child that maybe somebody else wouldn't take care of or wouldn't be able to take care of the way that I can. And this was a part of God's plan. God, why not? me. But it doesn't always come out that way. It just doesn't. But what we have to take on faith is that sometimes God's ways are higher than our ways. That he has a plan. He has a perfect plan. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God does not make plans to, to hurt us, but to prosper us. And even in the moment when it feels like it's hurting, God's plan for our lives is not to hurt us. That's why he gave us his Savior. That's why he gives us each other to lean on, to grow with, to go to church with, to, to fill the presence and the love of God with. But God's ways are higher than our ways. Number three, God's presence is always enough. God's presence is always enough. Now, this is a little more about us than it is about God. But what I want you to understand is this is about God. Because when you're praying to that on-demand God and he appears to not show up, his presence appears to not be in your life, it's really easy to walk away from him. But when you're praying to God the Father of Jesus, God of the universe, the God who created everything, and you understand that his ways are higher than your ways, and you're, you're putting yourself in, in your proper place, and you're putting God in his proper place, what you'll understand is if you trust Jesus as your Savior, God's presence is always with you. God's presence is always with you. On the mountaintops and in the valleys, God's presence is always with you. There's a man named King David. You're probably thinking, well, if you've never heard of David, like he was a king. Of course, his life was easy, but it wasn't easy. David was chased most of his, most of his young adult life by the king who was on the throne that God had put on the throne, but had told him that his kingdom was being taken away from him, and he didn't want David to have it. And he chased and hunted and, and caused battles and wars and tried to kill David. And David was spared time after time after time. But David's life was not easy. And so in Psalm 23, this is the, the good shepherd passage. Some of you, if you were in church as a kid, you may have even memorized Psalm 23. But in Psalm 23, verse 4, David wrote, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, or you may have memorized, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen, it's on the mountaintops that we get to experience the power of God. When we're having our best days, man, when it's just going great, and there are 354 people here for Easter. That's a mountaintop experience, all right? You can applaud that. There were 354 people here for Easter, all right? When you're having your best days, God is with you. That's experiencing the power of God. But listen, I believe that it's when we're at our lowest when we're in the valleys, that's when we most closely experience the presence of God. When we want to get closer to God. And his power is still there, but his comforting, loving arms can wrap around us. And we, instead of running from God, should understand that he's right there with us. And we should draw closer to God. Whether we're on the mountaintops or we're in the valleys, God is always with us. I want to, uh, to share. I just want to be open for a minute about me personally, because I think sometimes people look at the pastor and they think, man, his, his life is perfect. It's, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, it may not be perfect, but it's really good. You know, like he gets paid to just talk on Sundays and man, that'd be awesome if I got paid to do that. And, you know, he's close to God because he's always in God's word. And so God's always taking care of him. And it's just great. And, you know, his family never has any problems. But that can be further from the truth. And personally for me, and I'm just going to tell you, this has gotten better and better over the years. But I still have struggles. There are things that I struggle with. And, and listen, when I say personal, I'm going to say like two weeks ago. 
The week leading up to Easter was sleepless nights. There wasn't anything like bad going on, right? I mean, it wasn't like my marriage was breaking up or, you know, all my kids were sick or a house I'm trying to build burnt down. There's nothing like that, right? None of those bad things happened. But the week before Easter, I just sort of hit a wall. And I don't know if it was um, just kind of stress and tension. I don't know what it was. But I'll be honest, I just kind of snapped one night. And I didn't um, get violent or anything like that. But here's what I've learned over the years. When I hit those walls, I'm a runner. Now, you, you, you can't probably picture me as a runner, right? I mean, or maybe you can. I've got this beautiful runner's physique. I would love, love to run all the time. No, I'm not a runner. But here's, here's what I do when I'm in the valley. I run. And so the week before Easter, there was a night where I literally, driving down the road, Put the car in park and got out and started running. And that's your pastor, struggling. And it's been a long time since I did that, but I ran for a while and my wife came and picked me up on the side of the road. I didn't say anything the rest of the way home. When we got home, you know what I did? I opened up the car door and I went running. I ran a couple of miles. I'm not a runner. So it was some running and walking. Right? <laughs> but I ran. And when I run, when the run begins, and, I, and I, this doesn't, like I said, this doesn't happen very often, but when this happens, and it's less and less as I get older and older and closer and closer to God, but here's what happens when I run. The run begins with me running away. I'm running away from problems. I'm running away from life. And if I'm completely honest, I'm running away from God. I'm running away from that on-demand God who didn't answer my prayer exactly like I wanted it answered. And I'm on the run. I'm running for my family, for my wife. I'm running for love. I'm running for everybody. And I don't want anybody around me. That's why I run. Because I get to be by myself. I used to drive. And I realized I was wasting gas. Too expensive. I don't run as far. I drive a whole lot farther. But I don't run nearly as far. So I run. But as I run, and I begin to process, and I begin to think, because I've spent so much time in my life with God, God begins to remind me, it's not all about you, son. He begins to remind me about, about how blessed I am, my wife, with my four kids, with an amazing church, building a house, and just all the blessings. And he begins to remind me, I sent my son for you. And Satan right now is working in your mind, and he's lying to you, and he doesn't want you to... To, to embrace this. He wants to ruin your Easter and I don't want you to go there. And it would be really easy for you to just get back in your car and take off driving and clean out a bank account and disappear and never come back. But that's not who you are. That's not who I designed you to be. You're better than that because I made you holy. I sanctified you. When I look at you, son, you're perfect. You're clean because you've been cleansed and you've been covered by the blood of the lamb from the inside out. I'm going to be real likable right now, but I love you, and I want to do something in you. And as I run, and I run, and I run, what eventually happens is, as I'm running from God, I turn the block, and I start running back home, and I begin to run back to God. And those promises of God become prayers to not on-demand God, but prayer to God, where in my valley, I feel the love of God and the closeness of God. And then I can come back and stand on this stage and preach and I can hug my wife and love all my kids. But the reality is we all have struggles like that. There are days when all of us want to run from life's problems. And there are days when all of us want to run from God. That's what repentance is all about. The Bible says when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We use that word repent, repentance. It literally means to turn around. You may be running from God, but what God wants you to do this morning is to turn around and run back to him. He's there with open arms. He wants to receive you just as much as he wants to receive me. It's not because I'm special. 
There is nothing special about me because I'm a pastor that I believe that God welcomes me with open arms. It's simply because I decided to run back to him. And over and over and over again in my life, I have to keep running back to God. Because everybody strays occasionally. And your stray may be a little farther away than my stray. My stray lasts about a half an hour. Here's my last 30 days instead of 30 minutes. I don't know. But every single time, God welcomes you back. And in that valley experience, God wants you to experience him. John 12, 27 and 28. If you're reading your eye feet, you read this this week. And I read this Wednesday night as we were studying. This, these are the words of Jesus. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus. Just before he was arrested and crucified, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. This is around the, the, the Last Supper that he's having with them. And he says to them, now my soul is deep in trouble. Have you ever been in a place where your soul is deeply troubled? A couple of weeks ago, whatever was going on with me, my soul was deeply troubled. The reason Jesus' soul was deeply troubled was because he knew he was about to die. That's the conversation. That's the context that he's talking to his disciples about. Is, is, is in a few hours, I'm no longer going to be with you. Like, it's imminent. It's coming. I'm no longer going to be with you. They didn't completely understand it. But Jesus' soul was deeply troubled. Should I pray on demand, God? Save me from this. Should I pray that? Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Jesus didn't pray to on demand God. Jesus prayed to our Heavenly Father, the God of the universe. And in his worst, lowest, deepest, most struggling moment, when he could have called out, and without a doubt, because he was 100% God and 100% man, he could have said, Father, save me. Take this pain away. End it. I, I don't want to go to the cross. It's too much to bear. Let's come up with plan B. What Jesus said was, no. This is what I was created for. This is God's will for my life. So whatever God's will is for my life, Father, I want to glorify you. I want to make sure that I'm bringing glory to you. See, on-demand God is an easy God to walk away from. But the God of the universe, who you understand always loves you, his ways are always higher than our ways, and, and his presence is always enough for us, just like it was enough for his own son, Jesus, to die for us. When you realize that, then you realize that in this moment, whatever the struggle is, God, I don't know how you're going to get glory from it, but God, I want to give you glory for it. That's not praying to an on-demand God. That is who God is. And that's how we pray to the God of the universe. On-demand God does not exist. So when people say things that make you think like, oh, oh, you mean God doesn't do everything you want when you want? The answer to that is no, of course not. Because if I served a God that bowed to the whim of every man, would that be a God worth serving? My God is way too powerful. He's way too wise. His wisdom is far higher than my wisdom and his magnificence and power is far greater than my magnificence and power ever could be. That's the God that I serve. If you will close your eyes and bow your heads for me this morning. God is the supreme creator. He is the sustainer of life. He gave us his son. He always loves us. His ways are always higher. His presence is always enough. It's easy for me to say that. Sometimes it's hard to trust that on faith. But if you found yourself walking away from God, if you found yourself running from God lately, please understand that the God you've probably been running away from is the on-demand God. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to run away. But it's not okay to stay that way. It's not okay to keep running. God loves you too much to leave you that way. God leaves you too, loves you too much to leave you alone. And I believe this morning, if you've been running, God has brought you here for this time, in this moment, at this hour, for this purpose, to draw you back to Him. So God, we're praying to you. 
Not our own demand, God, but our Heavenly Father. God, I want to lift all of us up, but especially this morning, God, those who are listening to these words and this ringing true in their hearts. Their souls have been troubled. There's been something keeping them from following you and, and giving you their full faith, their full heart, their full life. God, for those this morning that are realizing they've been running away from a God that doesn't exist, God, I pray right now that they'll just simply turn to you and run back to you. If that's you this morning, as I pray this prayer, just silently, where you're seated in your heart, make my prayer your prayer. God, thank you for loving me. I realize now that I've been believing in or not believing in a God that doesn't even exist. But God, I want to believe in you, the creator of the universe. God, I want to believe in you who loves me regardless of me. God, I'm trusting that Jesus died for me. And I give my heart to you. God, thank you for taking me just as I am. Jesus, thank you for dying for me, for loving me. And God, even when I mess up, thank you for taking me back. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.